I am excited to share with you uh, a new teaching series called Pursuing Holiness. I have these books being printed. That's, that sign said in two weeks. It should be one if the printing company cooperates and gets them here on time. But uh, these books, everybody will just get one uh, that's here. We'll just get one for free. And uh, so if you want uh, one of these, just keep your eyes open and show up next Sunday, all right? And uh, there will be uh, 40 daily uh, devotional times, just basically about a five to ten minute video once a day where you can kind of learn and process. We're going to be building a theology of what the Bible says about holiness, which is a mega theme of Scripture that starts in the beginning and goes all the way through uh, the uh, end of the Bible. And so we'll be kind of building that out and talking about how God makes his people holy. Now, if you notice the verse there, Hebrews 12, 14, it says, Without holiness, no one sees the Lord. How many people want to see the Lord? <laughs> yeah, like, I want, to, I want to be there. I want to see him. And so he makes us holy and we're going to talk about how that happens, all right? And so uh, we'll be uh, looking forward to sharing that with you coming up. Um, I want to uh, uh, share with you also that, that Mid-Southwest Youth Camp is coming up. There are some uh, little uh, announcements for that back on the foyer table. And so if you've got teenagers, grab one of those on your way out. Talk to Jamin Hughes for more details about that. And that this year, last year it was, it was on at a campground kind of local here in Oklahoma City area, about uh, 45 minutes out of the city, something like that. And this year, because that campground was not available, they are having to move it to Texas. And so it'll be a few hours away, but uh, it'll be the same, uh, the same group, same folks in charge. And, uh, and I think it's going to be a good, uh, good event for your kids uh, to go to and be strengthened spiritually and in the process have a lot of fun. And uh, so uh, please keep that on your calendar, June 21 through 24. All right. I think that's all the announcements I need to highlight for you today. And we're going to look into the Word of God together. It is a joy to share God's Word always. Uh, but this happens to be my f one of my favorite stories from probably my favorite book of the Bible, all right? I'm not using a handout today, so I want you to grab the Bible, if, uh, grab your Bible or the one in, the, in the, book, uh, the book rack in front of you there, and I want you to go to the book of Acts, chapter 2. It'll be further toward the back. It'll be Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, all right? So like that uh, in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the stories of Jesus uh, from four different men. And then when we get to the book of Acts, it tells us the story that a lot of people don't know. Almost everybody, almost everybody who attends church with any regularity knows what happened for at Jesus' crucifixion, right? So Jesus is crucified, he dies. Most people know that thir on the third day, on a Sunday morning, Easter Sunday morning, he came back to life, he rose from the dead. And he showed himself alive to his disciples. They saw him. They touched him. They saw the prints of the nails and the print of the spear in his side. They literally ate with him and talked with him. But then there's this period of 40 days that Jesus appears to them uh, as alive and teaches them more things. And then he ascends back to heaven and a lot of people don't know what happened after all of that. They, people just kind of like it fuzzes out right there. And then it's like, uh, well, what happened? Right? Uh, I'm not really sure. So today we're going to talk about what happened right after that. Okay? So Jesus rises from the dead. He appears to his disciples for 40 days. He ascends back to heaven. They're standing there on a hillside and talking with them, uh, talking with him. And then he goes back to heaven. In fact, in Luke chapter 1, there's, uh, the, I want to start reading in Luke chapter 1, where it says uh, in Acts 1 1, in my former book, Theophilus, I began to write, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. In other words, it's kind of like Jesus started doing all these things, and the book of Acts is going to be the book where Jesus continues to do, all right? He began to do and teach, and now he's going to keep doing it. He's just not going to do it with a physical presence here, he's going to do it through the Holy Spirit. So Jesus began to do and teach, and this is going to be the book of how Jesus is still ruling and still teaching and still working in his church. Now, continuing on, until the day he was taken up to heaven, in verse, uh, verse 2, it says of Acts chapter 1. Now, I want you to skip down with me to verse number, uh, verse number 7, I'm sorry, verse number 6. 
Then they gathered around him and they asked him, Lord, at this, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? So they're like, Jesus, is it now you're going to make Jerusalem the capital and you're going to uh, you know, give us authority and we're going to be able to stay here and our lives are going to get better and you're going to crush the Romans and all this political stuff is going to like go, all the political challenges are going to go away and everything's going to be united politically? Ah, yeah, no. <laughs> no, wah, 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 for the disciples, right? They're like, is this, is it now, is it now? And Jesus says, it is not for you to know the times or dates that the Father has set by his own authority. Okay, guys, stop it, right? Stop it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Move on from that. That's not what's important right now. What's important? Look at verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Wow. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. So Jesus says, I have a huge job for you to do. You're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth, the ends of the earth. If you look at this on a map, it's like this. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the earth. It's like the rock was thrown into the pond and the ripples are going to spread all across the world. So Jesus kind of challenges their, their kind of political, nationalistic kind of understanding. They're like, oh, you're going to make the nation of Israel, that's going to be the, the thing, right? It's going to be the, you're going to give us political authority and power. And, and Jesus said, actually... I've got more going on than your country. I've got more going on than what's in front of you, right? what you're thinking right now. It's not just for Jews, it's for all people everywhere. Jesus has his sights set on a whole lot bigger target than the disciples had at this moment. They're zoned in on how can we uh, politically get this pulled together and let the Jews be the center of it. And Jesus says, I've got a whole lot bigger program in mind. Now when they see that, and they see that Jesus is caring for and wanting the spread of his kingdom to all people and all places, that's a huge job. Like, these guys, they're uneducated, primarily uneducated, common laborers. They've lived all their life in one small province, pretty much, in a backwater part of the nation of Israel. So much so that when one of the disciples was, uh, when one of the disciples uh, was, was there, they, they were in the trial at Jesus, they identified them by their hick accent. Did you know that? They said, you've got to be one of those Jesus followers. You're from Galilee. They're like, yeah, we recognize your accent. They were, they, were, they were identifiable by the fact that they hadn't done any, anything and they hadn't been anywhere. In fact, when they later on, they get in front of uh, some educated people and the educated people are surprised at how well they know the Bible and how, well they, how much authority they have because they, they didn't expect guys like this to know all this stuff. This is who these guys are. So they have literally spent their life laboring and casting fishing nets and these kinds of things. And all of a sudden Jesus says, oh, and you're going to go to the whole world. Now, this means, if you're, if you're thinking in the disciples' brains with me for a second, this means all of a sudden they're like, the whole world? Like, I don't know how to speak those languages. I don't know where those people are. I don't know how to get out there and where? How? This is a huge job. And Jesus says to them that he wants them to wait until they are clothed with power from on high. He says, I'm going to give you power that's going to make it possible for you to do what you couldn't do otherwise. Now, in this, I had to set that up for you because in this moment, you know the disciples are in some ways encouraged and strengthened and excited wow Jesus has given us this big mission he's given us this huge task but I have an idea 
that in the back of Peter's mind, he's like, it was only about a month ago, a month and a half, that I was really excited about how I was going to fight for Jesus. And then when the time came, I wimped out. You remember that? Peter came up to that moment where it was time to stand for something, right? It was time to stand and be what Jesus wanted him to be and say, yes, I know him and he's, the, he's my savior and I follow him and I'm not ashamed. And instead, he cursed and swore and denied that he knew Jesus. He came right up to it and wimped out. And you know that's got to be in the back of his mind here. Is it going to happen again? I'm going to go out and I'm going to start to say something for Jesus. I'm going to start to be what he wants me to be. I'm going to start to live a life that's what he wants me to be. And I'm going to wimp out. And I'm going to go right back to the old life. Now, if you and I are honest with ourselves, we've faced those same feelings at certain points in our life too. Because you come right up to a moment where you're like, you were in a great service, you heard a great sermon, you read a scripture, and God, a powerful moment, God just showed himself to you in a very real way, and you're like, oh, this is great, I'm going to change my life, I'm going to be something for God, I'm going to make a difference in the world. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You've had those kind of moments? Yes. And then that little voice in the back of your head says, yeah, but you said that last time too. <laughs> Okay, maybe only three or four of us have, but some of y'all, I can tell you in your eyes, you know what I'm talking about. You've been there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be, I'm gonna be the exact what God wants me to be. I'm going to hold my head high, and I'm going to be a proud and glad and happy Christian. And then you get to work, and you're like, I'm not sure if this message is welcome here. So what did they need? What did they need? Let's go to Acts chapter 2. Because Jesus is going to give them what they need. In Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Now let me stop and explain this because Pentecost is not a word we throw around very much anymore. Pentecost means 50 days, and it was the, it was the 50 days, uh, a, a holiday, a celebration the Jews did 50 days after the Passover. So after the weekend where Christ was crucified, 50 days later, there was this, uh, this celebration, and Jews from all over the world would migrate into Jerusalem and for this big celebration, a big feast that's like the world's fair for, uh, for Jews. Okay? They would come in, they would build these, uh, these uh, tents, and they would all live outside for a period of time, and, and they, it was like this big family celebration, family members from all around the, the world that were Jewish would come back together again. Some of them weren't even, like they didn't even speak Hebrew. There were all these different places and different nationalities, and they would come and they would celebrate together the works of God way back here in the old part of the Bible, right, in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus. Now, they all gather together. The, the disciples are there and they're praying. It's been 10 days since Jesus went back to heaven. So 10 days passed. Jesus goes back to heaven. He says, wait for the power of the Holy Spirit. 10 days passed, and on a very strategic day when Jews from all over the world are gathered together, God says, now it's time. And he does something incredibly powerful because he's going to enable his people to accomplish the mission that he's given to them. He's going to give them the power they need to get across the line. Let's look at it. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled all the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Now, I'll stop for a moment and say, these are pictures, visible manifestations of the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, all through uh, the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit is signified by breath or wind. The word ruach in the Old Testament in Hebrew means breath, wind. It also means spirit. So the same word. In the New Testament, in Greek, the word pneuma means wind or breath or spirit. So when the spirit comes, there's this dramatic moment where there's a sound like a mighty 
hurricane that comes through and the Holy Spirit comes. And then another symbol of the Holy Spirit is fire. So the purifying, cleansing, empowering, consuming force of fire shows up and instead of being just one pillar of fire like it was in the Old Testament, when the Spirit of God came down on, th on the temple, there was one pillar of fire that would rise up and lead the people forward. You remember that? Now, there's pillars of fire again, but they're individual and they spread out. Instead of being one, they spread out and they touch all God's people. So now, is whereas there used to be one spirit guide, one place where God guided his people, now God is saying, I'm diversifying the blessing of my presence. Everybody knew that the spirit was there in the Old Testament when the, when the fire was, was resting over top of the tabernacle. And now everybody knows, all the Jews in this moment would have known, oh my, the spirit is with me. He's resting on the tabernacle. He's resting on the temple. Now, I don't know if anybody is excited by that or not. I am, all right? Because that's cool. All of a sudden, we are freed from, in our day, we are freed from one solitary place where you've got to go to be with God. All right? You want to know where God is? Go to Israel and go to the temple. That's where he is. And instead, in our day, God says, the Holy Spirit comes and you are the temple. And the, the spirit which used to be in one place is now in many places. He is in many temples. He's resting on you. Oh, that's amazing. That's beautiful. Continuing on, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, other languages, as the Spirit enabled them. Now, in our day, I understand that some people process this as though it's some sort of uh, unearthly language or additional heavenly language. The truth is, in this scripture, everybody understood what was, these are real languages, because they're, everyone knew, they all heard, this was the language that, that there were actual languages. There are 13 different nationalities that it lists here, and in these 13 different places, they spoke th all those languages. God knew that there were going to be people from the ends of the earth, remember, that's where he's headed, and he knew he was going to gather them all together. And in a moment of time, God says, I'm going to save, I'm going to fill my, my messengers with the Holy Spirit. They're going to spill out into the streets, and I'm going to enable them to speak languages they never learned. Wow. I had a, uh, had a my dad had a, had a uh, professor in Bible college that uh, was, knew just a little bit of Spanish, just a little bit. And he was preaching in Mexico one time. And he was preaching the gospel, and he, was, he heard the interpreter who he really didn't know very well. He just found someone to try to interpret for him. And he knew that this, he could hear, this guy's not saying what I'm saying. And he said, I just prayed and said, Lord, you've got to help the message be clear. And suddenly he began to speak in Spanish. And he, spoke, he preached the rest of that message in Spanish. And he said, when it was over, I couldn't do it anymore. <laughs> Sometimes the Lord works in dramatic ways in, in, to forward his kingdom when he knows this is what needs to happen. And God does this in this moment. Now, we could talk about other situations. Say, is this always what happens? No, not always. I'll talk about that in just a little bit. But the truth is that he gives the ability and the power to do what is necessary to spread the good news of Jesus. That's good news. Continuing on. When they heard, uh, now there were saying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Now, if you were in, uh, let's say, let's take you and just drop you, kind of you and your family down in, uh, let's say, uh, Quebec, Montreal. I don't know if you know, but Montreal is a French-speaking a French speaking city in Canada. I traveled to Montreal one time and we were touring places and all of a sudden the street signs are in French and all the people are speaking in French and I and I'm like it's a weird feeling. It's very surreal. Like nobody if something was wrong, nobody would know because I can't tell them, you know. 
And in those moments, if you hear somebody speaking your language, you're like, <laughs> oh, that's the, let's, let's, go see, let's go talk to them. They know what I'm saying, right? And so this happens in Jerusalem. 120 people spill out of the upper room. By the way, this is an exactly, exactly backwards from the way it was before the Holy Spirit came. Before that, they all gathered together and locked the doors, right? They were like, it might be us next. The Jews are going to come and get us. They're going to crucify us next. And now the Spirit comes and they spill out to the world. Last time they were silent. This time they are speaking, right? And so they spill out into the world and it says, verse number 7, utterly amazed, the people asked, aren't these who are speaking Galileans? They're from here. Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. You see all that? Like he lists them out on purpose to help you understand this is a big diverse crowd here. And they're all hearing the message of, of Jesus proclaimed in their own language. Now, verse number, uh, the, the last part of verse 11, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues, our own languages. Amazed and perplexed, they asked each other, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Now, I've never been drunk, but I'm not sure it does that. <laughs> I'm not sure it does. But you know what? Hear me out. Anytime you're full of Jesus... There will always be people who try to explain it away and mock it. I promise you, that will always happen. No matter how powerfully the Spirit is upon you, there will always be people who deny that Christ is working in you and through you. That's always going to happen. So just mentally prepare yourself for that, all right? Don't worry about what the crowd says. Continuing on, verse 14, Then Peter stood up with the eleven, and he raised his voice and addressed the crowd, Fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people, and your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy wow he points back to a, a place in the in the old testament in the book of joel the prophet began to speak of the future that he saw where all god's people would be filled with the holy spirit now i want you to skip down to verse number 22 fellow israelites listen to this jesus of nazareth was a man accredited by god to you by miracles wonders and signs which god did among you through him as you yourselves know this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Wait, 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 wait. All right. Is this the same Peter? Because, I'm telling you, it was only six weeks ago when a little, one little girl, now he's in front of a crowd of thousands of people, but one little servant girl at the trial of Jesus comes up to him warming his hands by the fire and says, aren't you one of his disciples? And Peter says, no, I don't know that guy. I just happened to be in town and uh, heard a commotion and thought I'd come in and warm my hands. And uh, who's, who's this? Jesus, you say? Who? It was just six weeks ago. This guy was that guy. What happened? Two things happened. One, Jesus rose again. And that matters. That matters. I mean, because at a certain point, you're like, okay, what are they going to do to me? Kill me? You know? You know, kill me? Oh, yeah, you did that with Jesus. I saw that. And he's kind of back alive again. So, you know, that, that's one thing that happened. But the other piece of this puzzle is that this uncertain vacillating, changing, super bold, but actually with a little bit of cowardliness in his heart. That Peter is now full 
of a power that is not his own. He is controlled by something other than himself. And he's different. He's changed. He's all of a sudden looking at a crowd of thousands of people that are gathering together in Jerusalem and saying, you killed Jesus. He was God's man, and you killed him. What are you going to do about it? Continuing on, he says, verse number 23, this man was handed over to you, and you killed, you put him to death by nailing him to the cross, verse 24, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. He quotes from, the, from David's, uh, some of David's writings, verse number 20, uh, let's see, verse number 32, verse number 32, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. So, verse 36, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Messiah. Wow. Peter stands up, and suddenly there is with him and within him a power that is not his own, a strength and a boldness that is not his own. And he's preaching the gospel. Now, the, the crowd is struck by this. The power of the Holy Spirit was such that the conviction of God, the convincing of God, fell on these people. I don't know if you've ever had this moment where you suddenly realize, maybe it was in a church service, or maybe it was driving down the road, maybe it was in prayer, maybe as, it, as you were reading the scripture, maybe it was for none of those reasons, but suddenly the Holy Spirit was with you and suddenly you knew right and wrong so clearly. I had a situation, a, a, a moment with my oldest boy. I've told this story before, but it bears repeating because it's so illustrative of what I'm talking about. My oldest son, Darrell Lee, was, was going through a really challenging season when he was a young boy. He was starting to grow up, and he had an opinion. <laughs> and his opinion was different than mom and dad's, right? And so he was just, he was going through a, a hard-hearted, stubborn, uh, the Bible uses the word stiff-necked. Anybody ever know what I'm talking about? If you've ever grabbed hold of your child's shoulder when you're trying to talk to them and they're in this moment, you'll know it because they're stiff-necked, literally, right? And we've, we've all had that moment where we're stiff-necked, Right? And stiff-necked means you don't do, want to do what authorities want you to do, and you don't want to do what God wants you to do either. Right? <laughs> Stubborn. And I would try to discipline him, and I would try to teach him, and I would try to talk to him, but it seemed like no matter what we did, it was not helping. Like there was no change. There was, and I, we were getting worried because I know that I'd rather not deal with that at 15 right? I'd rather deal with he's 15 now. <laughs> I'd rather not deal with it now when he's like as big as me. And so we, we called, I called my parents, my wife called her parents, and we, call, we said, hey, could you pray with us? Because we, we feel like there's a crucial moment here, there needs to be a softening of heart here. And I was, literally, I was in Ponca City, Oklahoma, driving along, and we were talking with our family, we were on our way to this little bookstore that we were going to, and, and just happened to be visiting Ponca that, that weekend. And we were driving in, I pulled into, the, into the, the parking lot, and we hadn't even been talking about the things of God, or it wasn't like we were discussing the Bible and talking about something weighty. And we pulled in, and I got into the, uh, into the parking space, and I opened my door and opened the sliding door on the minivan and reached up to take Darylee down out of the, of the van. And when I reached up to take him, I saw that, big tears had welled up in his eyes. And I said, buddy, is everything okay? Are you all right? And he said, dad, I, I've sinned a lot. And I was like, oh. <laughs> and I said, well, let's talk about it. 
So I picked him up. I sat down, back down in the driver's seat of the car, and, and we talked about it, and, and we talked about Jesus, and we talked about forgiveness, and we talked about, and I prayed with him, and my wife and I can both testify, things changed from that moment forward. Like it was a dramatic change, a dramatic shift all of a sudden. His attitude and his stubbornness and all the it shifted. Let me tell you what happened. The Holy Spirit convicted him. Right? The word conviction in the scripture means convincing. And so it's like in a moment of time he was convinced. I could have talked for an hour and I wouldn't have convinced him. You know what I'm talking about? Like I could have been like, this is wrong and you can't do that. And I'll tell you what, you're just you're being a, a terrible person, a terrible boy. You're just living in sin. And, and I, could, I could have talked and talked and talked and the words coming out of my mouth were going <laughs> like that, right? But in a moment of time, without me even doing anything, the Holy Spirit convinced him. If you've ever had that moment where you suddenly realize, I've done wrong. I have. And these people in the crowd, the Holy Spirit is working so strongly that they have a moment like that. The whole crowd. And it says in verse uh, number 37, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. <laughs> oh. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? We've sinned a lot. <laughs> What, what shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit because the promise is for you and your children and for all those who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Now, Keep your Bibles open because we're going to turn back a little bit further later on in the message, but I want to stop and I want to process with you what we've just gone through. So we've just told this story about how the Holy Spirit filled his people and how Peter, under that power, preached the good news, how God worked in the people's heart and they realized they needed to repent and turn their back on their sin and believe in Jesus and be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. And it says that 3,000 people 3,000 people were saved that day. Powerful moment. God strategically began his church. This is the birthday of the church. Now, here's the question I have for you. First of all, if you're not, if you're not sure whether you're a believer, do you believe what the apostles preached? That's the first thing I have to ask you. And I'm just going to put this in because if you are... If you are not one of those who have been waiting for the filling of the Holy Spirit in obedience to the commands of Jesus and following Him, then maybe you're one of those ones in the crowd who really hasn't thought about it. You've heard of God and you've heard of the Ten Commandments and you've heard of, but you're not really sure where you stand with God. And if the Holy Spirit comes along and convinces your heart, oh, I've been wrong and I need to follow Jesus, then you need to listen to that. And you need to believe the message of the apostles. Your sins and mine nailed Jesus to the cross. And he will come again to judge the living and the dead. But you can be forgiven. And that's the message. That's the gospel message of the apostles. You can be right with God through Jesus. He has come to inaugurate his kingdom. And you can be part of it. Now, the next question I have to ask you is this. If you're a believer and you're following Jesus, when we talk about how to be filled with the Holy Spirit, what are we talking about? What is repeatable from this story? Because let's be honest, this is a little dramatic. This is a little bit of a dramatic story, right? It's like, are we going to, like, should I expect to see little dancing tongues of fire on everybody's head? Like, is that when I know I'm filled with the Holy Spirit? Oh, look, I've got the fire. Yep, all right. Is it a mighty sound of wind? Should we expect that? Is it maybe, um, you know, evangelistic success? You know, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to speak, and everybody at my my work is going to get saved. Three thousand people, right? Well, is it the languages? That's how I know I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. There's languages spoken. 
But let me take each of those things and kind of respond. First of all, if, if the tongues like fire is the way you know you're filled with the Holy Spirit, um, I don't know anybody who is, right? <laughs> I just, I don't think that's what's repeatable. In fact, we read the rest of the, of the book and there's people filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts 4, in Acts 8, in Acts 10, and none of those places records anything about tongues of fire. Okay, so what about the sound of wind, like a ma- mighty breath of the Spirit blowing? N- no, not in Acts 4, not in Acts 8, not in Acts 10, not repeated. I think, personally, that this is God putting His stamp of approval, His, his, like, no, his um, demonstration, His manifestation of, in, a, in a visible way, because the Holy Spirit had been waiting for this moment. God had been waiting for this moment since, the, since Moses said back in the Old Testament, Moses said, oh, I wish that all God's people would have His Spirit upon them. Remember that story? He had, God had been waiting for this moment for centuries. And now He says, yes, it's here. And He releases His power. And, great, and I love it. That's great. But that's not the essence of it. Right? It's not what's repeated. What about, what about the languages that were spoken? Well, in Acts chapter 4, the people are filled with the Holy Spirit, no languages. Right? In Acts 8, people are filled with the Holy Spirit, no languages spoken, no, no record of it at all. In Acts 10, they're filled with the Holy Spirit and languages are spoken. Now, in Jerusalem on Pentecost and in Acts chapter 10, both of those places were multicultural centers. Lots of languages spoken there. In Acts chapter 4 and chapter 8, not so. So the Holy Spirit had no, there was no reason to give a dramatic language gift in Acts 4 and Acts 8 because no, no lots and lots of languages present. But in Acts 10, he does it again because there were lots of languages present in that moment, in that place. Now, let's continue on. What about, what about the huge number of people saved. Maybe it's evangelism success that marks the filling of the Holy Spirit. Well, no, I don't think so. Let me tell you why. Because in Acts chapter 7, Stephen preaches. It says he's filled with the Holy Spirit, he's preaching, and he's so successful that they kill him. There's not a ton of people saved. Right? There's not a whole lot of people saved. Instead, they stop up their ears, they don't want to hear it, and they throw rocks at him until he dies. <laughs> so I think we can say that the mark of the filling of the Spirit, it's not like, well, I know I'm filled with the Spirit because I have lots of success in preaching the gospel. Not necessarily. Not always. So what is repeatable? Well, let's go to Acts chapter 10. I'm sorry. Acts chapter 15, okay? Peter looks back on the day of Pentecost, right? He looks back at that day, and he he comments on it. Now, in, in Acts chapter 10, Peter preaches and people are filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 10, and when he's looking back in Acts 15 verses 8 and 9, he comments on Acts 10 and 2, all right? So he's looking back and he's commenting on what was important in those stories. Let's look at it. Acts 15, 8 and 9. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them, these Gentiles in Acts 10, by giving giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Oh. Oh. This is what Peter notes as significant. You notice he didn't mention any of the other things, the languages, the fire, the wind, none of those things. He didn't mention the 3,000 people that got saved. Instead, what he put his finger on says, here's how we know that the Holy Spirit was in both places, is that he purified their hearts by faith. He cleaned them. He purified what was there. Now, this is an amazing, amazing idea. Because in John 17, Jesus was praying over his disciples. You don't have to go there, but I'll just tell you. In John 17, Jesus is praying over his disciples. And he says, 
to them, Lord, I want you to sanctify them through your truth. And in John 15, he's talking to them and he says, you all are clean. You're clean. The word there is catharsis in Greek. You are clean through the word that I've spoken to you. And then in Acts 15, he says, in Acts 2, what happened is he purified, he catharsis our heart by faith. Now, this is interesting because when they begin to follow Jesus, Jesus said, I'm going to clean your hearts. When you begin to follow Jesus, Jesus forgives you. He does. He wipes clean your heart. Everybody say amen. All right, that's true. He, he cleanses our conscience from dead works. But as, as best I can understand, we live, uh, and, and from, from my own experience, from hundreds of other Christians that I've talked to, we begin to, we begin to follow Jesus. And we come to recognize, looking at our hearts, we come to recognize that there's still something there. There's still something that isn't right. There's still a, self, a self-sovereignty, a self-life. There's still a self-protection like Peter when he wants to protect himself. There's still a self-promotion like the disciples who followed Jesus and said, um, Jesus, would you let us be the number one and number two guys in your kingdom? Come on, Jesus. Let me sit at the right hand and him sit at the left. We'd like to be... It. The other disciples were mad. It wasn't just James and John. It was the other disciples. When they heard that they were trying to get the number two and number three spots right behind Jesus, the rest of them were mad. And there arose, it says, there arose an argument about which one was the greatest. <laughs> they were following, wait a minute, they're following Jesus. They're clean because of the word he's spoken to them. But there's something there. What is it? The Bible calls it the flesh or the sin nature. Right? There's, there's this self-nature, this self-sovereignty. I want my way. And I would like to suggest to you that what happened in Acts Two, is that Jesus comes along and through the power of the Holy Spirit he says I'm going to clean up that part of you I'm going to straighten out that part of you that is bent towards self and sin and I want to control you fully that part of you too by the Holy Spirit and so when, when this happens Peter's heart which was bent toward his own protection is bent instead toward the glory of God. Peter's and James and John's heart, which was bent toward their own promotion, gets bent toward the promotion of the kingdom instead and the promotion of Jesus. Now, I don't know how else to explain it. I don't know how else to say it. I believe that the purifying work of God, the purifying work of God happens in our heart when we are filled thoroughly with the Holy Spirit's power. Now, I don't think it's about all these other things, languages, tongues, whatever, all that stuff. No, I think that God gives us the power of the Holy Spirit to make us what we could not be by His power could not. It would have been futile to tell Peter, you're going to be a witness all across Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth, if his heart was still like it was at Jesus' trial. It would have been hopeless. Something had to change. Something had to give. And in Acts chapter 2, it did. That didn't mean that Peter knew everything, that he figured it all out, that everything was perfect. And it didn't mean all of that. It didn't mean he never made a mistake. It didn't mean he couldn't sin. It didn't, didn't mean any of those things. It just meant that he was filled and controlled and his heart was cleansed and purified in a deeper way on, in, in Acts 2 than it was before. So I think that the first thing that we can repeat in my own life 
in, in, for the filling of the Holy Spirit is a purifying effect of the Holy Spirit's power. The second thing is an emboldening, an emboldening by the Holy Spirit's power. You see, when God, when Jesus sends the Holy Spirit, he empowers us to become bold for him. To become bold to say what needs to be said. To become bold to preach what needs to be preached. To become bold to speak the name of Christ in a way that needs to be said. To become bold to live unashamed and unafraid. Here's the question I want to ask. I want to ask you. What would happen in your Christian life if you were unscarable? What would happen in your following of Jesus if you were unfrightenable? If the opinions of men did not scare you? What would happen in your heart? What would happen in your workplace if you simply couldn't be scared? If you couldn't be beaten down by the devil's attempts to scare you and make you fearful? What would happen What would happen if instead of being bent toward your own protection, your heart was bent toward the glory of God? What would happen if instead of being half-hearted in your walk with Christ, you were wholehearted? What would happen if your family members who used to be able to say to you, hey, come on, man, let's just go do this this one time. We'll have a good time. It's the weekend, man. What would happen if you had the presence, such fullness and control of the Holy Spirit in your life that you could lovingly and kindly say, it's not me anymore? See, I, I know. I know that you can. Not because, not because you're something special, but because you can so thoroughly receive the power of the Holy Spirit that he emboldens and empowers your life. The rest of the book of Acts is a story of how the power of the Holy Spirit made the disciples so bold that the gospel, the flame of the gospel, leaps over barrier after barrier after barrier. And it jumps over the, the racial barriers and income barriers and, 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 and barriers of skin color and barriers of family and barriers of ethnicity and barriers of country. It leaps over those things because the people who went were on fire with the boldness of the Holy Spirit. I think that God wants to empower our church. I think he wants to empower us to be those kind of people who are inflamed with his presence and power. God, who knows the heart, gave the Holy Spirit to them and to us. He purified our hearts by faith and empowered us for service not service for selfish ends but serving for the glory of God so the question that I have to the closing question that I have to ask you is this I don't know I don't know where you stand with the Lord right now maybe you are in a place where you are kind of you're like I'm, I'm following Jesus but I'm not really satisfied with where I am I, I know that I want to be right I know that I want to be wholehearted, but I feel like I'm half in and half out sometimes. And if that's where you are, I have really good news for you. That the power of the Holy Spirit can come upon you in such a way that he lifts you 
above those things and makes it possible for you to live in victory, to live in wholeheartedness, to not live double-minded, like James says, right? Staggering back and forth, but to live single-minded with the mind of Christ. So, for the next few weeks, for the next few weeks, we're going to be studying and looking through the spiritual journey toward and deeper into holiness. Holiness is gifted to you. Being holy is gifted to you at the moment of salvation. It is. I'm so glad because at the moment of salvation, I'm ready to see the Lord. But you see, holiness is not a static thing. It's not something you check off like, okay, got that. Right. It is a dynamic life with God. It is a journey deeper into God. And wherever you are right now, I can promise you that God wants you to take you deeper into holiness. I'm sure of it. I'm sure of it. So my call to you would be that together as a church, during this 40 days, we would seek the Lord. We would seek the Lord with a heart that says, Jesus, I want everything you've got for me everything take me as deep as you can take me take me as far as you can take me take me as high as you can take me I want all that you have for me and so here's all of me transform me fill me would you bow your heads with me before we pray I want to ask if you would simply join me for these next few weeks and that you would join me in seeking God for a, a greater measure of the fullness of the Holy Spirit regardless of where you are regardless of where you've been what your theology says regardless of that would you join me in saying Jesus I want more of you than I've ever had before show me how to go there anybody just lift a hand and say yeah I would do that yeah, we'll do that Let's do it together.